A very good evening to you all. It's seven o'clock in Johannesburg. Uh, welcome uh, to this dialogue uh, with Father David Neuhaus. Welcome to uh, the Jesuit Institute. I'm going to begin by just asking that we have a moment of silence uh, for peace uh, in the Holy Land before we start our dialogue. So let's just take a moment to pray for peace on Good Friday. You would know in the Catholic tradition, we took up a collection for the holy places the desperate situation there, ask the Lord for the grace of peace. Thank you. So I'd also like to, in a special way, uh, welcome and thank Father David Neuhaus, who is in Jerusalem, uh, who joins us uh, for uh, this dialogue. You'll recall that we spoke a number of months back before Christmas about the situation in Gaza. It has now um, developed. And so we really this evening want to take time to reflect on the developments and also just uh, look at some of the thorny issues uh, around uh, this ongoing and deadly uh, conflict. So to begin with, I'm going to ask you, um, David, if you wouldn't mind uh, just a sketching for us an update on how things are now and what are the feeling, what are the sentiments around you in Jerusalem uh, at this time? We saw those protests yesterday uh, in, 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 in Israel. Uh, if you would just give us a sense of where things are. So, Russell, if you permit, I'd like to actually begin with the Christian community because we have just celebrated Easter. And I want to sure. even hone in even more on the Roman Catholic parish in Gaza. I think still many people don't know that we have a parish of brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church and other brothers and sisters, Orthodox, who are living in the Gaza Strip have been gone have gone through these six months almost six months now of absolute horror bombardment uh, soldiers shooting into the church compound and we were all absolutely amazed and in tears to be able to receive pictures of the celebrations of Palm Sunday Holy Thursday and we said wow <laughs> If you can celebrate the resurrection in Gaza, that is a real witness to faith. Because I must say that with what is going on, the present uh, environment, the, the feelings, I speak only for myself to say it's been the hardest Easter ever to really believe mm. that in the midst of this horror, this ongoing horror, Christ is, is resurrected. And personally, I went four times during the past week to the tomb to really be in the tomb and pinch myself and say, yes, it's empty. Yes, it's empty. This is the witness to the power of the resurrection. But sadness reigns, depression, desperation in, in, every, in every corner. I think some of you might know that the Muslims are now fasting. It's Ramadan. And Ramadan nights are usually nights of great joy and celebration. But just as our Easter was depressed, so also Ramadan is depressed, as we all are flooded with images. You walk around the streets of Jewish Israel, and everywhere looking at you are photographs of the hostages who are still in the darkness of being hostages in Gaza. The newspapers are still flooded with stories, uh, more and more gory stories of what these people have gone through and what happened on the 7th of October. And in the Palestinian sector, as the Queen of Jordan said 
with great eloquence. She said, the 7th of October was an absolute horror, a catastrophe. But for the Palestinian people, every day since the 7th of October has been a 7th of October. So again, I'm painting a very dark picture. And really what we feel is there's very little light coming through. Every few days, a new plan is uncovered, a new voice is raised with some kind of brilliant idea, but the situation remains the same, a situation of death and destruction. And of course, as everyone knows, this the specter of famine, of people starving in the Gaza Strip. So it's very grim, Russell, very, very grim. David, you, you mentioned the um, <clears throat> 7th of October, and I'm wondering if we can maybe, you know, much of, of what's happening is focused on the current conflict, which began on the 7th of October. But if we really are to be balanced, we need to look at how we got to where we are today. Uh, this didn't just all suddenly explode like some people would have us believe on the 7th of October. And can, can you sketch a brief history just to situate us of the current conflict? So, Russell, that's a very important question and a very difficult one to answer, because depending on whose side you're on, that would decide where you begin to sketch out the conflict. And telling the history of the conflict is made very complicated because you say in order to be balanced, but sketching out the conflict can be very ideological. So, again, the 7th of October, we saw an explosion of incredible violence. And yet, as you point out very well, it's not violence that came from nowhere. The Gaza Strip is a place of enormous suffering. I would imagine that not many people among the listeners have been to the Gaza Strip. I have visited a few times. The Gaza Strip is an area where 70% of the population are refugees who were forced into the Gaza Strip as a consequence of the 1948 war. And since 1948, it has been a place of poverty and overcrowding that makes life there very, very difficult. But if we go back before the 7th of October 2023, we can go back to another turning point in the history of the Gaza Strip, 2005, when the Israelis unilaterally ended their occupation of the Gaza Strip. From 1967 to 2005, the Israelis were a military presence in the Gaza Strip. Now, when they pulled out, of course, what almost immediately happened was that the siege was imposed, sealing off the Gaza Strip to the outside world, making going in and going out of the Gaza Strip extremely difficult. And explosions of violence since 2005 until now, every two or three years, a war between the uh, Islamic party that runs the Gaza Strip, that won elections shortly after the Israelis pulled out, that uh, Islamic movement is called Hamas, and the Israelis are going backwards and forwards, leading to destruction, loss of life, um, generally uh, um, violence coming from the Gaza Strip, which is like a pressure cooker, and then Israel responding with incredible military force to crush that violence. But of course, we can go even further back. Uh, we can go back, as I mentioned, to 1967, when Israeli, when the Israeli army occupied the Palestinian territories that were not part of the state of Israel. Or we can go back to 1948 when the State of Israel was created. Is that the beginning? Uh, and uh, the State of Israel was mm. created on 78% of the land of Palestine. And no Palestine was, was, has ever been created. Uh, some promises in the 1990s that we were heading towards some kind of statehood for the Palestinian people, but it never really was realized despite the best intentions of many leaders in the West. But I think that if I were to plot out the history of the conflict, I would start in 1917. 1917 was a major turning point. Until then, the population of Palestine, around 700,000 people, 
a small minority of Christians, a small minority of Jews, a vast majority of Muslims. These were the indigenous inhabitants of Palestine. Again, important to realize, yes, there were Jews there already then. What happened in 1917, a few weeks, six weeks before the British invaded during the First World War, seizing the land from the Ottoman Empire as a part of the First World War, they made a promise that Palestine or a part of Palestine would become a Jewish homeland. And of course, this was because Jews in Europe had lived very difficult lives mm. in some parts of Europe sometimes, and there was sympathy for Jews. Why to Palestine? Well, isn't that what the Bible says in a kind of fundamentalist uh, taking over of the biblical text? And of course, the British also saw the Jews as being Europeans like them as potential allies for their empire. And so for 30 years from 1917 to 1948, when the British pulled out of Palestine, having created a total mess and realizing they could no longer control it, but for those 30 years, they encouraged massive Jewish migration to Palestine. And that migration increased by many fold after the state of Israel was created in 1948. So here we have this very complex conflict of the Palestinians who say the Jews have arrived as colonial occupiers and they must be pushed out, and a Jewish population saying, we have no home, and the only home that we have ever thought of as really a home, a safe place, is this land. And these two populations have now been in conflict for over a hundred years. Uh, so yes, in 2024, when we look at what's going on in Gaza, it's really an intensification of the struggle. I want to mention, uh, as you said, the sentiment. I think that many, many Palestinians feel that what they are witnessing now or living in the Gaza Strip is really reminiscent of what happened in 1948 when so many Palestinians were pushed out of their homes. We refer to that in our uh, parlance here in the Middle East as the Nakba, the catastrophe. Mm. Uh, uh, Palestinians who lost their homes, lost their lands, were pushed into exile and were never allowed to return. And I think that many Palestinians are reliving that traumatic experience, saying, is that what this is going to lead to? Are we again going to be pushed out, even of the places in Palestine where we have become refugees? On the Jewish side, of course, and it's parallel, uh, there is a real sense that the 7th of October was a expression of incredible violence against the Jewish people that really push some Jews into reliving the trauma of the Holocaust. And this language, mm -hmm. this very extreme language of Holocaust, Shoah versus Nakba, is a part of the discourse that is being bandied about uh, as both sides look for support and uh, try to legitimate are uh, the violent actions that they're engaged in. Of course, with an absolute imbalance, as Israel has this incredibly powerful military, and the Palestinian forces, those of Hamas, are not nearly a match. But yes, on the 7th of October, they took this very powerful country and its military completely by surprise. Mm. You... You, you kind of mentioned there at the right at the beginning as well, um, when you said it depends who's telling um, the story, it depends on how you tell the story. I mean, this war in Gaza has also been a war of much propaganda and falsities. Uh, we know that information and counter information flows all the time. What role do you think the media are playing uh, in this war? Uh, just uh, this morning, we saw that Netanyahu has passed a law which would enable him, for example, to kick one of the major networks, Al Jazeera, out of the area. Um, what ought we to believe about what we hear about indiscriminate killing by the IDF, people being used as shields by Hamas, uh, widespread star starvation, for example? Now, how much can we trust what we're hearing? So before we go into a critique of the media, I want to say thank God for the media. Thank God we have media that is following closely, that is projecting images, 
that is giving us at least a part of the narrative. And I would say that this war is, at least in my experience, a war that has been almost a visual experience as we watch, whether it's Al Jazeera mm. or the channels that more closely are aligned with Israel, constantly showing and documenting the experiences of the 7th of October. So first of all, thank God. Thank God that we have access to this kind of uh, visual that really helps us, at least in part, to enter into this tragedy, this catastrophe that is unrolling before our eyes. But then, of course, yes, from what perspective are things being shown? And you ask, how can we know what is true? And I don't think that there is really any other way than exposing ourselves to more than one uh, form of media. So Al Jazeera, mm. which has incredible journalists on the spot that are really documenting what's going on. Of course, they have a very particular ideology that they are supporting. They are very pro-Palestinian, but they're journalists with enormous courage and many of them have been killed and members of their family have been killed. And this has also been documented by Al Jazeera is I think a precious, uh, a precious media that is helping us see a part of the picture. But I think that if we only watch Al Jazeera, then we will not have the critical ability to begin to discern when Al Jazeera is presenting fact and when Al Jazeera is telling things more from the Al Jazeera perspective, which is from the Arab-Palestinian, uh, it's a television station based in the Gulf. Um, so I think that that's when we might turn to more Western media that also have their own perspective, their own ideology. They tend, many of them, to be very, very pro-Israel or turning to Israeli media that are presenting, at least mainstream media, the very Israeli narrative. And I know for myself, when I wake up in the morning, I read two Israeli newspapers in Hebrew, I read two Palestinian newspapers in Arabic, and then I open up Al Jazeera, and I have a very quick peek at what some of the American media are saying in order to, again, try and formulate some more whole picture of what's going on. But I don't think that we need to fall into, oh, we can't know what's going on. We know that something absolutely horrific is unfolding before our eyes. And I think that we need to be scandalized by the fact that this is going on now for almost six months and a world community upon which both sides are absolutely dependent, do not seem to have the muscle to domesticate the two sides so that humanitarian law is respected, proportionality is respected, that the most basic thing of all, enough food gets into Gaza so that people do not die of hunger. And I think these are facts that are incontrovertible. And we all know that at least that is going on, even though every little uh, detail might be uh, interpreted or reformulated by one side or the other. Mm. Mm. Um, I maybe want to uh, just return a little bit to the religious side of things, um, David. Um, I mean, for example, Pope Francis has spoken out about this war many times. Uh, right from the start, he made a very powerful statement where he said that any war is a defeat for everyone, for humanity. Yet some voices have been really vociferous in their critique of what he uh, said. Uh, what is your analysis of, of, of the situation? Because there is a, a, a real sense that, you know, you've got the politics and religion all sort of mixed up in this whole uh, narrative. Um, I, just to get your sense of those vociferous voices, um, for example, I think people in this country, South Africa, would know that one of the one of the most vociferous voices uh, against the Holy Father was the chief rabbi, uh, who really took him to task. Uh, but mm -hmm. others have followed. Um, yeah. So first of all, that? I want to say very, very clearly. Again, my personal take on this is: thank God for the voice of Pope Francis. As you said, right from the beginning, 
on Sunday, the 8th of October, the day after this violence unleashed, he made the statement that you just said, war is defeat for everyone. And he repeated that after having said it many, many times. He repeated it last Sunday, Easter Sunday. He said, war is an absurdity. War is a defeat for everyone. And I think that the Pope is focused not on judging whether this fact or that fact is correct or incorrect. The Pope is looking at the suffering of the people. Mm. And when I say the people, I mean every human being in the struggle. The Pope has been absolutely clear, constantly calling for the release of the hostages and was very clear about condemning the violence of those people who broke through the Israeli border and engaged in acts of atrocity on the 7th of October. But just as he was clear about that, he's been absolutely clear about the incredibly vicious bombardments by the Israelis of the Gaza Strip. And of course, once they entered with armies, uh, the, the, the massacring that has taken place, he's been absolutely clear about that as well. And I think what he's holding is a value that we can all identify with, and that is the value of every human being. On Sunday, it was very, very moving when he referred to children in the Gaza Strip turning to the adults and saying, why, why? And he talked about children who no longer know how to smile. Ah, they've lost their smile. So again, I think that the Pope, more than making a political judgment, is really speaking to the sanity of the world and saying, how can you let this go on? How can it just continue? Now, those who condemn the Pope ah, tend to be very, very concerned, like uh, the chief rabbi of South Africa, with the safety of the Jewish community. Again, it's not completely absurd that a Jew living in the diaspora uh, would be concerned about the future and safety of the Jewish people. I don't think it should be ridiculed. The problem is that Rabbi Goldstein and many other diaspora Jewish voices who hold in their heart the fear and the, for the future of the Jewish people do not really know what's going on in Israel. They want to believe uh, that Israel is a society that is democratic, that the army is the most moral army in the world, but they don't really live here. They don't really follow on a moment-by-moment -moment basis what is going on. And I think that it is also true that many Jews, even some of those who are speaking up very loudly for Israel now, or at least since the 7th of October, before the 7th of October, were very willing to critique Netanyahu and recognized that Netanyahu's non-democratic uh, political ideology, Netanyahu's mobilizing of the most extremist politicians into his government was something that they did not agree with, something that they were willing to critique back then before the 7th of October. Those voices are starting to speak out again, but for some months they fell silent as many Jews were mm. focused again on this absolute trauma of believing that they had been secure in the state of Israel and suddenly realizing that perhaps they'll never be secure if Palestinians cannot also find security. They will never have proper uh, defense, proper peace and tranquility if Palestinians do not have proper defense, peace and tranquility. And so if there is any possible light on a distant horizon, it will be that Israelis and Palestinians will recognize that their, their own security depends very, very much on making sure that the other side has security, peace and tranquility, prosperity and justice. Um, I guess as a sort of follow-up to that, David, we, we've seen the, the decision by the United Nations, we've seen the decision by the International Court of Justice. I'm just wondering inside Israel what the feeling is about that, because it's, you know, from our vantage point here, it looks as if 
the Netanyahu government has decided just simply to ignore that completely and carry on with, with business as usual. Oh, would that be the, the sentiment there? So I think that the Israeli government is flailing. I, it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know where to turn. The Israeli government is very divided. There is a tr terrible fear among many Israelis, even people who might be right-wing and not particularly supportive of Palestinians, that Netanyahu is in a war of survival of himself. The thing that that really bothers mm. him the most is that if this war ends, he will be he will be brought to account. Because as we said earlier, the huge surprise was that the Palestinians succeeded in breaking through and creating so much destruction and devastation on the 7th of October. And we still don't know why. But voices are starting to emerge within Israeli society, voices that say that he is the big obstacle to any kind of future to any kind of negotiation that will release the hostages, that he simply doesn't care because the war is serving his own purposes. And so many Israelis are fed up with, with Netanyahu. Uh, his popularity has really uh, gone down the drain. But let us not think then that many Israelis are willing to listen to the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations is seen as a body that is dominated by people who are hostile to the state of Israel. Um, I flew back after spending a month in South Africa at the side of my mother. I flew back to Tel Aviv from Johannesburg on th last Thursday night on the last flight of the Israeli airlines out of Johannesburg because the airlines decided probably pushed by the government, that South Africa is a hostile country and therefore we don't want to fly there anymore. Uh, it's very sad uh, that many people in Israel are no longer willing to listen to voices from outside. And I think that some people who would have been listening to these voices before the 7th of October no longer want to listen because of a kind of trauma, a desire for support from a world that is seeing the destruction and saying we can't support that destruction. It's not proportional. It's not, uh, it's not focused. Okay, you say you want to destroy Hamas, but in fact what you've done is you've destroyed the Gaza Strip. And again, uh, we see a kind of very illogical, incoherent Israeli discourse that is yeah, being being condemned right and left. Now, it's taken the US government a very long time to start to put pressure on Israel, but pressure has indeed started even from there. Again, we are almost six mm. months into this conflict, six months of incredible, catastrophic devastation uh, of a small strip of, of land where 2.2 million people live, and they've been pushed to the extreme. So. Yeah, not, not too many lights on the horizon right now. But at least I hope that something is starting to change. Um, friends, I want to also give you an opportunity to uh, ask questions. And the way we'll do that is if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to uh, put it in the chat and uh, we will pick it up uh, from the chat. The chat function uh, on Zoom, uh, you'll see a little toggle on the bottom of the screen where you can type your questions in. Um, but before, I just maybe have two more questions because I think these are very important as well, David, and that's, you know, um, there has been, I think, from my perspective, uh, a real strides in Christian Jewish uh, dialogue and relationships in the last uh, number of years. And what do you think this conflict is going to do to Christian Jewish dialogue and especially maybe even a Jewish-Catholic dialogue. Um, it, it seems that we're on a precipice when it comes to, to that as well. So I think that right now we are in a crisis. Uh, people, mm. Jewish people who have been close to the Catholic Church engaged in dialogue have expressed enormous discomfort with the positions taken by Pope Francis once again, I think, personally, that Pope Francis has been a voice of clarity in a time of enormous confusion. And so there have been expressions that achieved a kind of peak in the middle of November 
when over 400 Jewish intellectuals, rabbis, professors who were engaged in the dialogue with the, the Catholic Church wrote a letter to Pope Francis and said, you have to understand our, our situation. We feel like the world is against us. And the one place where we thought we were safe, we aren't safe. And I think that within the context of the dialogue, we need to hear that. But let's also be perfectly clear that within the dialogue, one of the most difficult subjects that has repeatedly emerged is the state of Israel. What is the, the, the state of Israel within the dialogue? Now, Jews have many, not all. Of course, when you talk about Jews, you're talking about incredibly diverse opinions. Ah, the joke is always you have three Jews and ten opinions, but it's a great diversity. <laughs> but with regard to the state of Israel, uh, there is a very common sentiment among Jewish people that this is more than just a state. This is a homeland. This is where we can be safe, even for Jews who don't live there. And so what do we as Catholics say about that? And the church has been remarkably clear in its teaching. In a document that was published in 1985, uh, the church made perfectly clear that we as Catholics, we can understand a Jewish sentiment of belonging to that land. But when it comes to a state, that state must conform to international law. And Catholics are not are not supposed to theologize uh, the state and its activities and, and policies. By the way, this is something very importantly formulated in the Catholic Church. I often meet with our evangelical brothers and sisters who make a, what for me is a total confusion between the Jewish people, the state of Israel, the Bible, everything is kind of mixed up together. And what comes out sometimes are horrific opinions about what is going on in Israel with regard to people who are not Jewish in the state of Israel. So again, I think that the, 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 the church is being very clear, saying we are engaged in a very important dialogue with people who share an incredible heritage with us. It's the people of Jesus, of the apostles, of the early church. But at the same time, this people who says the state of Israel is almost a theological entity, we can't accept that. Now, we cannot accept a state that does not uh, conform to basic principles of international law. Now, I think that this crisis must lead us to a place of greater clarity. I want to add to this the fact that for the first time in centuries, we have a pope who is not from Europe. And the Jewish-Christian dialogue has been very Eurocentric. It's mostly Jews who are coming from a European background, engaged with Christians from a European background. And of course, when we say that, we can immediately understand that the major thing that these people are dealing with is the terrible heritage of anti-Semitism in Europe and the peak of that anti-Semitism in the Shoah. Pope Francis arrives on the scene. He's coming from Argentina. And he's bringing with him not a moving away from Jewish-Christian dialogue or Jewish-Catholic dialogue. He was very engaged with Jews in Argentina. But he's bringing with him other themes that need to be addressed and among these other themes are also questions of justice, economic justice, social justice, migration. He's bringing with him a real seriousness about the dialogue with Muslims. It was on the books since the Second Vatican Council, but I think that Pope Francis has really engaged in that interface with Muslims in a way that perhaps his predecessors didn't do because, again, they were more focused on the European scene. And all of this means a kind of shift. And I want to insist it's not moving the Jewish-Catholic dialogue out of the center, but in the center, making space not only for the Jewish-Catholic dialogue, 
but with, for the dialogue with Muslims, for the dialogue about justice, for the dialogue about migration that touches very intimately on relations with Islam. And I think that he's mm. saying this also to Jews. What is very interesting is that after the Jewish, those Jewish intellectuals addressed him the letter in the middle of November, he answered them. Ah, the Pope sent a response. It was an, actually a personal letter of the Pope to the initiator of that letter uh, that was penned in the name of more than 400 Jewish uh, intellectuals. She's a professor, young professor of Jewish Catholic relations at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And what is very interesting in the text that he wrote to her was one, we know Pope Francis, he loves people. It was a warm embrace of her and her colleagues and all Jews in Israel. But at the same time, when he spoke about reality, he put on the same page in every sentence that he mentioned about what's going on, Israelis and Palestinians. In other words, we need to stretch open our discourse so that what we are saying really is able to be inclusive, to include Israelis and Palestinians in a better future. And for me, what was most powerful is he used the Jewish Catholic paradigm as a model for what could be perhaps one day an Israeli-Palestinian dialogue. For he said, look, here we are, we are talking to one another. We love one another, we're engaged in dialogue. Who would have thought that was possible after our bloody history? Who would have thought that in the last decades we have developed a relationship that is profound, a relationship of brothers and sisters? And he then uh, hints that Perhaps this is a model we should hold this, our relationship being a real relationship of conversation and, and, and uh, trying to repair a broken world and hope that one day Palestinians and Israelis will share a relationship like that. Last point that I want to mention is something that happened last week, which was very interesting. The Pope received in a private, very brief private audience, but then spoke about it in the, the general audience on Wednesday, he received two men, uh, an Israeli mm. and a Palestinian. And these two men are active in a bereaved parents circle. Both of them have lost daughters. Uh, the Jewish Israeli mm. man uh, lost his daughter in the explosion of a suicide bomber. And the Palestinian man lost his daughter when she was shot dead by a soldier coming out of school. And these two men are, by the way, their relationship has been novelized by an Irish writer in a wonderful novel called, and I don't even know how to pronounce it, it's something like Air Pegon, uh, something like that. Um, I think that the writer, his name is something like Colleen McCullough. And it is a magnificent story that opens a horizon in a reality where all the horizons seem blocked. And I really felt mm. moved and, and, and challenged by the fact that the Pope held up uh, <laughs> the two men at the last, at the last audience. Mm. And you sort of touched on this. Um, I remember I was part of the Pope's media team when he visited Morocco. We went to Rabat, a very small Christian community. We visited with the Pope a small community of sisters who were basically just looking after uh, Muslim people. There was no, there was no Christian in that community that they were looking after. Your sense of um, the Pope, as you said, has made strides to try and engage with, uh, you know, the Muslim people. Your your sense of where that dialogue may be now. Do you think that it is? Um, perhaps also in sort of jeopardy, or maybe less so at this time? So I certainly think that uh, the dialogue with Islam that has taken on much greater dimensions in the time of Pope Francis, remember that the opening came again with the Second Vatican Council, the same document mm. that in its fourth paragraph promoted relations with Jews, Nostra Aetate, in its third paragraph promoted relations with Muslims, and this has been on the church agenda. There have been those that have, work, that have been working for it. But Pope Francis has pushed that beyond where it perhaps was. Ah, fascinating again. Ah, this mm. is Pope Francis, really creative and 
and throwing open doors that might be shut. When he came to the Holy Land in 2014, he invited to come with him two friends from Argentina, a rabbi and a Muslim sheikh, who accompanied him everywhere. Ah, I was at the Mass with Pope Francis in the Senegal in the Room of the Last Supper, and there they were. They had accompanied him through every step of the way together. Again, I think that his message has mm. been very consistent. Uh, this is new for Jews, okay, to share the, the center stage with others and in a particular way with Muslims. So I think that the Pope in the present conflict uh, has shown himself to be somebody who's really trying, and it's very difficult, to be open to all sides and not to allow our discourse to be completely colonized or dominated by one narrative. I don't know if everybody knows this, but we certainly know it, that the Pope has called almost every day the parish in Gaza, the Holy Holy Family Parish, wanting to hear from the priest, from the sisters, news about the parish. And let's speak for a moment about that reality in Gaza of our Christian community. Uh, it's our Roman Catholic parish, 150 people, okay, many more people taking refuge in the church. We've sometimes had 600 people living in the church during the, the last months of conflict, but the parish is tiny. We have in the Gaza Strip Catholic schools, four Catholic schools. Needless to say, it's not for Catholic children. The vast majority, 98.5% of the children who go to our Catholic schools are Muslims. Okay, Ismail Haniye, who is one of the leaders of Hamas, sent his children to the, to the parish school because it's, of course, considered one of the best schools in the Gaza Strip. And so our church in the Middle East, throughout the Middle East, but especially in a very, very important way in Gaza, is a church that is at the service of those who need education, health, social welfare, uh, we we are giving a witness in the midst of the war that is essential to who we are as church. And of course, some Christians don't even like that. Uh, some Christians feel very uncomfortable. They, they, you know, why is the church not for us? Why is not all the help for us? But that's not who we are as church. Okay, so again, yes, Pope Francis is bringing this into vision. And I really hope that many, many Catholics will become more aware of that and how important it is in no way pulling back from the engagement with the Jewish people, but bringing to that engagement our deep, profound conversation with the Muslim world where we have brothers and sisters who sometimes share our values, share our vision, and with whom we are called to build a new society in Palestine, in Israel, and everywhere else. David, I want to come to some of the questions that are piling up in the chat. The first one is, can you tell us how supportive the body of Palestinians are of Hamas, especially their actions on the 7th of October, holding hostages and allegedly hiding behind innocent people? Okay. So I want to share with you something that is a little complex. By the way, it came out at a dinner party I was in, invited to in South Africa about two weeks ago. I think that many of the people in the West use Hamas as a synonym for terrorist. Hamas is a mm. terrorist. But that's not what Hamas is in the Palestinian reality. Hamas is a very diverse social political movement that spends a lot of energy on setting up schools and clinics and offering health care, not to say that there's not a part of Hamas in its political echelons that is also corrupt and lives a good life when others are suffering. But Hamas for Palestinians, when you say Hamas, it doesn't mean the same thing as what it means in the West when people associate it with terrorists. So, yes, there are many Palestinians who say that they support Hamas. Are there Palestinians who then, those same Palestinians, would automatically support what happened on October the 7th? No, not automatically. And again, it's complex. Let's remember that on October the 7th, Hamas forces were sent into Israel with very specific military targets. They, I think, and this is my interpretation, were so shocked that they got in easily that many of these young men 
are full of anger, frustration, and hatred of Jewish Israelis, for whom, uh, for these young men, that is the occupation, the siege. They then went on, went on a killing spree of civilians. But they were not the only people involved. In fact, at a certain point, many, many people surged out of the Gaza Strip. We have thousands of people who crossed the border that day, and some of them committing horrific acts. Were they all done with the blessing of Hamas? Well, that depends who you ask. Okay, somebody that I happen to know who is a very top person in Hamas, uh, Basim Naim, has always claimed that Hamas was not responsible for the atrocities. He doesn't deny that there were atrocities. What he says is this was not the politic of Hamas. So it's complicated. You're dealing with a population mm. that has been living since 1948, five <coughs> generations since 1948, with an Israeli state that is seen as the source of their misery. It's the occupation, mm. it's the army, it's the police, it's the settlers who once upon a time in Gaza until, 19, in, until 2005 came and took land and built settlements, and that continues in the West Bank. So to say, do Palestinians like Jewish Israelis? No, many do not. Many wish them, you know, the worst things. And so, yes, on an emotional side, there would be many Palestinians who say, without going into the details, Ah, oh, the 7th of October was not a bad thing. Okay, we got, we got our own back. I think that here we must be very cautious. People are not completely coherent. It's not like they have one single opinion. When things go bad, they have an opinion. When things start to go a little better, they have a different opinion. And that's the same for Palestinians. So again, I don't want to say, no, the Palestinians do not support Hamas. Many do. Remember again, Hamas for them is not a terrorist organization only. It's a political party, a social movement. Many Palestinians are happy when Jews suffer because Jews have made them suffer. And that's not a good thing, but it's an emotion. Okay. And I would immediately add the parallel that, yes, it's also unfortunate that there are many Jewish Israelis who look at what's happening in Gaza and say, well, they deserve it. Are they getting what they, what they deserve? And so in this ideological war where so much brainwashing has gone on, where the word Hamas, the word Palestinian, the word Arab is immediately associated with terrorist on one side, and the word Jew, the word Israeli, is, com is immediately assimil assimilated to the word colonialist, imperialist, uh, uh, violent, wh whatever. Uh, in this, it's very hard to speak a language that can really say what's happening and a language that opens us up to a horizon, which is not the death and destruction that surrounds us right now. Thanks, David. We've got quite a few questions. I'm just watching time. It seems that the Jewish-Christian dialogue will become uh, difficult due to the present situation. What could be a way to get out of the impasse? So I'm not sure that we need to adopt a strategy to get out of the impasse. What I think we do need to do is be very careful about the language that we use. We can speak a language that is very offensive. And I've heard some of that language even in South Africa. For example, when we speak about the terrible devastation, the catastrophic destruction of Gaza, I have heard people say, oh, the Jews. Well, that's not the way to talk mm. about uh, the cause of what's going on in Gaza. I would even be very cautious to say the Israelis. I would be very insistent that we be specific the Israeli government and its decisions, the Israeli army and its strategic plans. And even there, if we enter into details, we see that they're not always uh, on, on the, same, uh, the same line. So again, developing a strategy tends to be some kind of diplomatic, political attempt to get out of a crisis. We're in a crisis right now. For many, many Jews in Israel and throughout the world expect us in the name of our friendship as Catholics, to support the war. And we can't do that. We can't do that. But the way we formulate how 
we do not support it. How we criticize it and even condemn it is very, very important in order to keep a conversation going. So again, it's not simple because people are being very emotional on both sides, but I think that we must keep our eye on how we speak, how what comes out of our mouths, and make sure that at least from our side, it's always a language that opens doors and doesn't shut them. Somebody's asking how open the Jewish people are to the idea of living side by side in a so-called Jewish state. So again, uh, you know, the Jewish people, oh, you have, there are in the state of Israel right now, 7 million Jewish people, okay? You will find a whole slew of, of opinions. And I think that, again, it depends very much what happened 10 minutes ago when you ask that question, are you willing to live side by side with Palestinian Arabs? What happens 10 mm -hmm. minutes ago will influence 80% of the population. So if what happened 10 minutes ago was that a Palestinian Arab who plays on a Jewish football team scored a goal against Israel's rival, then you'll probably hear 80% of the population say, of course, well, sure, sure, we can live with them. But if what happened 10 minutes ago was that somebody died in the present war on the Jewish side, then 80% will say, absolutely not, they should all disappear. So again, it depends when you ask that question. Personally, mm -hmm. personally, and I've just written an article about this, which I think is also available in English on the website of the Vatican Review called Civiltà Cattolica, I tried to look at the complexity of Israeli society and identify entire populations within Israel that are not as ideologized as the present uh, elite, the present political elite. So I talk about Jews that come from Arab countries. I talk about Jews who come from the ultra-Orthodox community, who have religious values, and really their main concern is the well-being of their own community. I talk about Jews who come from the ex-Soviet Union. I talk about Israelis who are Palestinian Arab, citizens of Israel, but Palestinian Arab. And I say here we have huge portions of the Israeli population that have not been completely ideologized according to the Zionist right-wing ideology of people like Netanyahu and the extremists that are in his government. And I say perhaps from there will emerge a discourse that will open horizons. Again, difficult to see right now, but I am committed to remaining as much as possible within uh, remaining sane, uh, seeing some, some glimmer of hope. Uh, I will mention that there is somebody in the government, uh, the Minister, Minister of Interior, who comes from a very orthodox and Arab Jewish origin, who for me uh, is like uh, when he speaks, not always, not always, but often a real uh, light bulb in the darkness that we are living. Somebody who's committed to a certain degree of morality, a certain degree of humanity, who is also courageous enough to speak out, even though he's a member of the Netanyahu government. Uh, so again, yeah, I think we need to look hard and not trust even uh, these opinion polls, because you need to say, what happened 10 minutes before the question was asked? Or how was the mm -hmm. question framed in order to get the response that the person asking the question wanted to get? And again, it means engaging deeply with Israeli society and Palestinian society, reading the literature, reading the poetry. I just again mention uh, that Yesterday, we lost one of our great, great authors. His name was Sami Mikhail, uh, Sami Mikhail uh, a Jew of Iraqi origin who wrote uh, novels over a long period of time. He moved to Israel in the 1950s. He died yesterday at the age of 97, a voice of absolute clarity on questions of humanity and and. Uh, uh, the the human being in the image and likeness of God, whether that human being is a Jew or an Arab. 
We've got about six minutes. There's three questions still. One is why is the Israeli government so opposed to a two state solution two state solution or two state nation? Okay. <laughs> I think that the Israeli government, in speaking to the Americans, would say, oh, no, we're not so opposed. It's just you can't trust Palestinians. Look at what they've done to us. And so they don't deserve to have a state. But the Israeli government, at least its official line, has been over decades, yeah, okay, okay, you Americans, you Westerners, you want a two-state solution, uh, we'll pretend that we are working towards it. But of course, a two-state solution means a state alongside Israel that is a real state. And Israel needs to be motivated to have a reason to accept such a state. And that motivation can be, unfortunately, violence, a liberation struggle by the Palestinians to get their rights through violent struggle, and until now, it has generally been that Israel is the stronger party and can crush that. The only other way is that the international community acts with much greater determination that there be a Palestinian state. What was promised to the Palestinians when the land of Palestine was partitioned on the 29th of November, 1947. And unfortunately, the international community has not been very insistent on that. Now, in the 1990s, we thought we were going that way. Uh, Palestinians and Israelis were meeting together and talking, strongly pressured by the United States of America and many in Europe to actually in engage in some kind of dialogue, some kind of talk about a better future. But the moment that the accords were signed, the pressure was turned off and the Israelis, moving more and more to the right, worked harder and harder to sabotage any hope of an independent Palestinian state being created. Today, there are many that doubt whether such a state can, in fact, be created. The Holy See still insists this is the official position of the Holy See. Many in the Western world say this is our official position. But when you look at the facts on the ground, the extent to which Jewish settlements have been built in areas that were supposed to constitute the Palestinian state, it becomes more and more difficult to see how, without incredible violent uh, uprooting, there will be the possibility of creating a contiguous Palestinian state. And so many are suggesting that now the real struggle, although it will take us back, but it's the only way to move forward, is the struggle for civil rights. That instead of Israel being a Jewish state, which excludes all those who are not Jewish, it become a state for all its citizens. And that means the struggle that you know only too well in South Africa for the civil rights, the equality and the dignity of each citizen as citizen, whether they're Jewish or Palestinian, Muslim or Christian, whatever they are, citizen, all citizens have the same rights. Thank you, David. There's still two questions. I'm the one I'm not exactly clear on, but I suspect the question is uh, just uh, kind of what is Zionism? People throw the word Zionism around. Maybe okay. if you could give a brief answer to that. So a very brief answer is Zionism is the Jewish national movement. Again, I think that many, many people in the Christian world think of Jews as a religion. But for centuries now, Jews have been defining themselves as a nation. And Zionism is their national movement. It began politically as an organization at the end of the 19th century in Europe, founded in order to, and here are the, the, the basic tenets of a very diverse movement, because there are Zionists that want to live with Arab Zionists who don't, Zionists who want extensive borders, Zionists who, who can deal with a more limited border. But the thing that all Zionists have in common is the following. We recognize that Jews uh, live a, a crisis when they don't have their own country. As a minority, their, 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 their reality is very much threatened. And again, particularly in the 19th century in Europe, in Eastern Europe, it was not a happy time 
for many Jews. So there's a problem, a Jewish problem. To that problem, there is a solution. And the solution is, okay, to migrate to the land of our ancestors, okay, to the land of our ancestors. Again, based upon a biblical text, a kind of, I would call it mythological reading of that biblical text. And in that land, create a Jewish state. I think that all Zionists would agree uh, that those four principles, there's a Jewish problem, there's a solution, migration to the land of Israel, and they're creating a Jewish state, would be a very generally held Zionist position. Again, then what do you do with the other people who live there? What are the borders of that country? What kind of regime should there be? What role does re Jewish religion play in the state? There, there's an incredible diversity within the Zionist movement. The Important question, to point out, time. of course, after oh. we've said that, mm -hmm. is that not all Jews are Zionists. Okay, there are Jews that are not Zionists. And of course, there are many Christians who support that Zionist ideology. The last uh, question is maybe a challenge for us, but maybe... Uh... You have a short comment. It's asking, Al Jazeera presented interviews with three Jewish Muslim groups in dialogue. Can we, as the church in South Africa, work with the Palestinian Jewish issue, maybe using Fratelli Tutti to reflect? The South African government is uncomfortably pro-Palestinian for many of us. So I won't relate to the last comment. Okay, the last comment being the South African government is too pro-Palestinian. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, the South African government has said that our freedom, as particularly as black South Africans, is not complete until Palestinians are free. And I think that that is a solidarity that I particularly respect. But um, going back to the idea of Fratelli Tutti, and not just Fratelli Tutti, but also the document that was signed on human fraternity, I think that most definitely there are within those documents are a real rich um, engagement of communities within the reality that we live. Uh, I will be participating on Tuesday in a conference in Poland by Zoom, hopefully, at least my, my paper is ready, to say what do these documents mean within the context of our present conflict, and I find within them many, many points that help us think beyond where we are right now. And that's really where we want to be. We want to be beyond this very, very dichotomous, dualistic, or you're pro-Israeli, or you're pro-Palestinian, and listen uh, to the voice of sanity, which says, I don't want to choose. I want to be pro-Jewish and pro-Palestinian. I think that anti-Semitism mm. is horrific. We need to fight it with all our might. But we are not anti-Semitic when we say that we want rights and justice for the Palestinian people. On the contrary, that's part and parcel of fighting for the Jewish people so that Palestinians can live prosperously, safely, securely, in justice, in freedom, uh, in, in, in equality. Uh, this is in the interests of our Jewish brothers and sisters. And this is the voice, I think, that is spoken both in Fratelli Tutti and in the document on human fraternity. David, I'd like to uh, thank you very much uh, for your time this evening. I know that uh, you have many things to do, uh, but we really appreciate, um, I think I can say, uh, you know, from all of us, a kind of a voice that is helping us to think these things through, because so often I think that's one of, we are intellectually lazy when it comes to sometimes thinking, thinking these issues through. And I think you really do offer a voice uh, to help us to think and to help us to interrogate and not simply just take in everything uh, that we uh, that we hear. So thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. I did put in the chat uh, for those of you who want to look, um, but you can also find it on the website. The Society of Jesus made a statement uh, just a couple of days ago called uh, We Cannot Be Silent. Uh, you will find that statement on the front page of the Worldwide Society, that's Jesuits.global. Uh, you, you'll find it there if you're interested in reading. Not a very long statement, but uh, quite a good statement and well worth uh, reading, I think, um, that came from uh, Rome. Maybe just to end our time together, let's once again uh, turn to the Lord. 
And let's pray for peace. We have tonight considered this terrible catastrophe in that land where Jesus himself walked. But we know too that there are deadly conflicts in so many other places in northern Mozambique, in Sudan, Congo, Ukraine, Myanmar. Lord, tonight we ask that you help us to work for peace, that you give us the grace, the gift of peace. And we pray most especially in solidarity with all our brothers and sisters who suffer the atrocities of war. We ask you to bless us and our loved ones this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.